Great. Um, okay, so let me go over um, kind of the format here real quick for everyone and what we're going to do. Okay. Um, so we're going to spend about 10 minutes. I'm going to give a quick introduction of mm -hmm. myself. Um, have you give a quick introduction of yourself. Okay. Um, then we're going to spend, uh, so that'll be about five minutes or so. Um, and then about 10 minutes, um, we'll kind of do some more general computer science questions, some more general like JavaScript, mm -hmm. uh, full stack developer questions. Um, then we'll do about 35 to 40 minutes, uh, which will be a coding exercise, um, which I wonder if we have, we don't. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, are, she, are you on Code Mentor? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Um, so what I'll have you do um, is if you'll just pull up an IDE um, and share your screen for the coding section um, mm -hmm. so everyone can see what you're doing from there. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and then I'll leave about 10, 15 minutes at the end um, for questions. Um, from First, I'll start with you, Shi. Um, mm -hmm. And hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, so correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we'll have, I'll give you, we'll have about 15 minutes of, for 15 minutes for questions at the end. Um, I'll start with you. You can ask any questions that you want. If we still have time after that, um, okay. we'll do a short audience Q&A. Um, mm -hmm. um, we do have a pretty hard stopping point at uh, one hour. Uh, a little over is fine, but um, we want to try and keep that time to kind of keep this online with that. So with that said, um, I will go ahead and give a quick introduction to myself. Okay. Uh, and then we'll switch it over to you. So mm -hmm. my name is Dan Hamilton. Um, I am a lead software engineer uh, at Map My Run uh, mm -hmm. Under Armour. Um, so we're a connected fitness platform. Um, not sure how familiar you are with that, but we have mobile apps and web apps. Mm -hmm. um, or managing your workouts. So when you go on a run, we manage that for you. We kind of keep the GPS, do all that kind of stuff. I focus on the web side of things, mm -hmm. uh, where we build like dynamic maps and display like the user data. Um, currently we're in the process of moving from Backbone and oh. Python over to React with Redux. Yeah. Okay. Node. Um, so I've been doing software for about 15 years now. Um, and I've also been doing interviewing for about the past 10 years. So I'm just going to run you kind of through my typical interview process that I do, uh, when I bring on candidates from there. Um, okay. If you want to go ahead and give yourself, uh, introduce yourself, tell me a little bit about you yourself, what you've done and some of the projects that you've worked on. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, my name is Shi Cheng, uh, and now I'm a student at Georgia Tech majoring in music technology. Uh, so, uh, in my undergraduate, I started, uh, uh, electrical engineer, and in my undergrad, I, I started to work on a project called Ear Sketch, uh, followed, uh, instructed by my professor, which is an online uh, musical uh, education platform that uh, aims to teach students computer science by making music. So uh, through doing this project, I fell in love with um, doing web tech, uh, web development and web apps. So uh, now I'm. Uh, I think uh, I'm turning myself into a web or a front end engineer. Yeah. And you might, uh, so uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh uh, yeah. So, uh, in my department, most of my work is to do some, uh, do something with a web audio API, uh, to manipulate the sound in the browser and show it to the, to the users and do some interactive music. And generally, uh, now I'm doing some, uh, web app development. So, uh, the, my most recent, Project, as you can see on my resume, is called Variadada.com. Uh, you can see it on the URL, and it's uh, basically a music online mixing platform that allows the musicians to upload their tracks online. And uh, for the users who are not musicians, they are allowed to mix others, uh, mix others' tracks together and create their own music. Yeah. Okay. And have you been working on this yourself, or are you working on a team with this? Uh, so for the ear sketch and for very data, uh, these are all uh, team projects. So uh, now I'm working, also working on my own uh, personal projects. It's called uh, uh, Eate. It's uh, it's pretty much like Uber Eat. So it's like uh, uh, I aim to to release this software in, in my campus. So whenever someone feels hungry but 
he or she is, is uh, so busy with her ho uh, schoolwork and don't want to go out and buy some food and he can use our uh, use my uh, web app to send a request uh, wait for somebody to deliver food to he or she okay uh, uh, and this one is yeah is, is still in pro progress of developing yeah. all right so this uh very data what was your role uh on that five person team what did what was your main role and what did you work on yeah so for the very data uh i work on two parts uh the uh node.js part and the angular part so for the uh for the whole project i mainly worked on uh several things such as the uh google google and facebook login and the uh the whole mixing mechanism and the uh notification uh on-site inside notification system. So uh, for these uh, three parts, I worked both on backend and on the front end. So for the backend, I wrote some uh, uh, APIs uh, with in Node.js that allows the uh, front end to call and provide some services and some uh, database manip manipulation. And for the front end, I do uh, Angular development and uh, uh, just show how the how the mixing works and how to uh, the how the users could store their data and mix their music with the backend. Yeah. Okay. And would you say that you're most comfortable with JavaScript? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so I'll get into some uh, some general questions here. Uh, I'm going to focus them around JavaScript and the full stack. Um, I probably won't get too much into the HTML and CSS side of things and design side of things. Okay. Um, Seems like you have mostly focused on the uh, you know the back end and the JavaScript side. So, um, so I'm going to start with a couple of very generic uh, web-based questions, uh, and then we'll move into some very specific JavaScript questions. Okay. Okay. Um, so, can you explain to me um, the HTTPS negotiation steps? So, what happens for it, during the process of HTTP? The handshake. Uh, the, the detailed handshake. Yes. Uh, I'm uh, actually I'm not so familiar with the HTTPS. I'm still in progress of, of learning that. And my, for my own project, I'm still using HTTP for connecting and sending requests. I know it's not safe anymore. And uh, so far, what I know about HTTPS is that uh, uh, we need a, a kind of certificate and a, a, and a API token for sending a request to the backend that ensure it is safe uh, and. Uh, yeah, it is safe for yeah, the. So, so go ahead and just uh, explain then how the HTTP uh, protocol works. Kind of just the handshake for that, since you're more familiar with that. Mm, I mean, how the uh, the front end send the request to the back end. Yep. How the HTTP. Yeah. Just a quick overview of that. Mm, well, uh, let me let me let me think about that. Uh, so first, the. Uh, mm, uh, mm. uh, actually, I, I haven't uh, dived into the how detailed the HTTP works. I just yeah. write some APIs and work work. So what I was just really looking for here is just kind of that it's a. Uh, request response protocol, um, whereas mm -hmm. you have like a client server type uh, mm -hmm. model, whereas mm -hmm. like the web browser um, will be the client. Um, mm -hmm. And it actually makes a request, um, in, which is just an HTTP message to the server. Mm -hmm. um, the server interprets this um, and returns back um, with the format that it sees fit, depending on the route that it could be. And it could return back stuff like an HTML file mm -hmm. uh, or a, uh, an image file or maybe even some JSON response. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's some different kind of uh, codes that can be uh, you know, deemed. Like a 200 means that everything was okay and we're gonna return back some data. Or a 403 um, where you're not authorized to actually hit that endpoint. Or a 404 where that doesn't exist. Oh, okay. Okay, all okay. right. Cool. Um, are you familiar at all with uh, Coors? Coors? Coors, yeah. Cross uh, request. Uh, I think in my, in my process of development, I've uh, looked up some information about Coors, but uh, I'm not sure I remember all of them. But uh, so as far as I know, a Coors is, to, uh, is, a, is a kind of policy that uh, protects the 
uh, the, the, the origins from the other side uh, to attack the, the, the aiming side. So, uh, and the, I think there are uh, several definitions for how to, how to define uh, if, if this if the request source is different from the, from the response source, the, including the port number and the URL, URL address. And uh, I think that there, are, there are five in total, but I can't remember them all. Yeah, yeah so so you're, you're pretty much on the right path. So it's just, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly what you've said here. It's just a, it's just a policy or a, a procedure mm -hmm. uh, for allowing like the service to describe the, the, uh, the request that's coming in and preventing um, things like other origins. Um, so maybe like preventing um, your website from being uh, like sharing resources um, between uh, another endpoint. So you've, uh, preventing another uh, website from hitting yours as well. Mm -hmm. So right on there. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So switching a little, getting a little bit here to more specific in JavaScript. Um, can you explain the this keyword to me? Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, this keyword is uh, yeah. This is a really com uh, complex uh, concept in JavaScript. So um, uh, as far as, uh, as, uh, as my understanding, uh, this keyword is bind to the context of when the function is executed instead of when it is defined. So, uh, so can I use some specific examples to yeah, explain absolutely. this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, for example, if we if we just uh, execute a function uh, in a global environment, and this will be uh, binded to the uh, to the global global scope. But uh, if we call, a, for example, if we have an object A and uh, we have a method inside called B and A dot B, uh, then uh, uh, in this kind of circumstances, uh, the, the, this would be binding to, to A, yeah, because we, we, call, we call the function inside of A. Okay. And uh, so uh, in JavaScript, there, there is uh, also some circumstances when this is not binded to our, uh, not, not as we expected, because sometimes, uh, for example, uh, JavaScript doesn't have a block scope. So sometimes when, when we call this, it, we thought it was binding to the function scope. Actually, it was binding to window global scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and and some 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 solutions to this is to use uh, things like the apply or uh, call function or use the bind method to solve this problem. Cool. All right. Mm -hmm. So speaking of the this keyword and and scope. Um, can you kind of explain what a closure is in JavaScript? Yeah, so uh, from my understanding, a uh, closure is that uh, you uh, create a functional scope, and then uh, inside that functional scope, we have another function, and inside the, the inner function, it can use the outer function's variables. So if we, uh, so it kind of, so when we call the inner function outside the outer function, the outer function's variable is, is enclosed inside the function. So it is like formed a module and private variable to the inner function. Okay, and what, um, what pitfalls or what issues can arise when using closures and what do you have to be careful of when using closures? Mm, pitfalls. Mm, I guess sometimes uh, we accidentally created some closures which cause uh, ex uh, external Mm, resource usage, and we didn't realize that. That might be one of that. Okay. Mm, okay. And uh, the other pitfalls. Um, yeah, I can't think of other pitfalls right now. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So let's keep going here. Uh, and we can bring up questions and answers and stuff at the end here. Um, okay. So can you explain how prototypes in JavaScript work? Okay, uh, so uh, JavaScript is pretty different from the other uh, uh, class or of, uh, oriented languages. So all of this is, is say an inheritance is based on its prototype. So every uh, function has its uh, prototype uh, object and uh, uh, all the, uh, we can store some method on their prototypes. 
so that uh, they are, uh, the other objects can, can kind of inher inherit the, product, the methods on their uh, parents' prototype. Yeah. Uh, and we use prototypes in JavaScript to realize the inheritance. Okay, cool. Yeah, very good. Um, so can you explain the difference between a double equals and a triple equals in JavaScript? Yeah, so uh, if we compare two variables in JavaScript with double equals, then uh, it'll, it'll just uh, compare the value instead of, uh, yeah, just compare the value. And with triple doubles, it'll compare both the value and the type of the variables. Cool. Um, very good. Um, so can you describe the significance and some of the benefits of using use strict um, at the beginning of your JavaScript source file? Okay, so if we use use, use strict and all the, uh, all the code we write in this file will be in strict mode and in strict mode, uh, we can uh, avoid some of the errors or some of the incidents that we accidentally created. For example, uh, I remember uh, in strict mode, if we accidentally created a global variable, it will report an error. Yep. Yeah, and uh, there are some other benefits that I can't remember right now, but uh, it's just a, a, a kind of solution to enhance your coding style. Yeah. yeah, and just as a quick side note, like some of the other things um, that the use strict uh, you know, allows or gives you benefits is it eliminates the this coercion. Mm -hmm. um, so then without strict mode, a reference to this value of null or undefined is automatically like coerced to a global, mm -hmm. um, which can cause like some pull your hair out kind of bugs. It kind oh, of yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in strict mode, referencing this value um, will throw an error if you're trying to do like a null or undefined. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it also makes um, using eval uh, a little safer um, than it is normally, mm -hmm. um, and also allows um, some prevent or like disallows duplicate property names or parameter values. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Um, so, can you explain what NAN is, and how can you test against it? In a uh, not a number. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, when we do some, uh, yeah, so for example, if we convert a string or other uh, formats of, of uh, variable type that cannot be converted to a number, and we will get a, a NAN, uh, not a number. And uh, uh, excuse me, what, what you just ask, how to avoid that? Yeah, how to, um, how to like check against it, yeah. Mm. check against it mm. or how do you like test to see if a value is equal to nan uh i remember we cannot use triple or double equals to check nan is that correct yeah so for example if you did like the type of nan Mm -hmm. triple equals to the string literal number mm -hmm. that would actually log out to true mm -hmm. or uh, assess to true. Um, but if you kind of compared NAN to NAN with a triple equals, it would actually return back false. So oh, yeah. the type of it, the type of NAN is actually a literal string. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Let's we'll switch Gears here. Uh, actually, real quick, um, can you define what a promise is in JavaScript? Uh, define promises. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, as to me, promises is a good way to uh, to avoid the callback hell in JavaScript. It provides a more uh, clear and more uh, a more more convenient way to to write uh, asynchronous JavaScript code. And so uh, a promise uh, has uh, three kind of conditions. It's fulfilled, pending, and, uh, and what is the third one? Rejected. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, uh, so if we write a, a promise, and uh, we, we can call the callback function with the then method and can, use, can catch their error with the, uh, the catch method. Yep, yeah. cool.
Yeah, very good. Um, so you mentioned uh, callback hell. So what is callback hell and how can you kind of avoid it? Uh, so callback hell is that uh, we use uh, so many callback functions inside uh, one, one by one. So we have one, inside, uh, one callback function inside the first one and then the third one inside the second one and back and forth. So uh, the, a good way to avoid callback hell is uh, to use the promise that I just mentioned. Uh, and the second way to avoid callback hell is to use the, some new features in ES6. Uh, I remember we can use the generator uh, generator function in ES6 to write some uh, uh, to write asynchronous JavaScript in, in a synchronous code, uh, synchronous mode. And also in ES7, I remember there is a a wait function, uh, a wait, a wait uh, operator. I haven't tried it yet, but I know there is something right there. Cool. Yeah, yeah. generators is a good additional kind of information out there. So. Um, mm -hmm. I won't, we won't go into too much details with generators. Um, we can do that at the end if you want, but um, that's a good point and good thing to look up. Um, so how does Node.js handle child threads? Uh, child threads? Mm, I'm not clear about that. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, we can go over that at the end, but basically Node.js is really a single threaded process. I'm so oh, uh, uh, wait, wait a minute, sir. So, uh, single thread. Uh, do you mean? Oh, uh, uh, so uh, as far as I, my understanding, so Node.js has a, a utilized the JavaScript's callback to to uh, to handle with the this kind of situation. So, yeah, uh, generally it it receives the event and put all of the uh, event handlers in a stack, and whenever uh, that that uh, that stack is, yeah, whenever in some some certain circumstance we need that stack to to execute that function, we will execute that function to the event event listener or handler, yeah. something like that. Yeah, no, that's, that's yeah. very yeah, very good. Um, so one last question here. Um, so typically, um, like basically like community published modules, that kind of stuff in Node.js. What is typically, or what is the best practice um, for the first argument passed into a Node.js callback handler? Mm, excuse me, sir, can you repeat your question? What is typically the first argument passed to a Node.js callback handler? Now this isn't required. Uh, uh, error? Typically error? Error. Error. Yeah. Yep. And why do you think that that's usually done that way? Mm. Oh, I haven't think of this question, but I guess it's uh, to remind people of more concern about the, the unsuccessful request or something like that. Yep. Um, so one of the other ones is like, because of a lot of like on caught exceptions that can happen, um, mm -hmm. In Node.js, it's not as uh, easy to catch exceptions uh, by the main process. Uh, so it's just kind of a best practice to kind of put that out there. So if people are, uh, it's, you know, that first message they're getting back is an error. So if they're using that um, or they forget uh, to like have multiple uh, methods by putting that error up there first, uh, they're kind of like throwing that to the very beginning to mm -hmm. kind of tell the developer who's using their module to be warned that this could be an error. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so that's it for, we're gonna kind of get into some of the programming questions. So if you want to, if you look down at the bottom of the screen, there's a share screen session. Mm -hmm. um, you could just bring up like a, a programming window and kind of share your screen for us. Sure. Yeah, okay, uh, can I see my screen? Yep. Okay. All right, perfect. Um, so we're just gonna start out by, I want you, and you can write this if you feel comfortable from JavaScript or any other, Node.js, whatever. I mean, Node.js is JavaScript, but any programming language you really want. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not really looking as much for syntax as looking for how you approach it. Um, so okay. it doesn't need to be perfect code, but try and get as close to compiling code as possible. Okay. Um, so I want you to write me a function or method 
um, that will check to see if a string is a palindrome. Uh, and a palindrome is a number, or uh, sorry, is a word or number that is um, the same forward as it is backwards. Okay. So like level, L-E-V-E-L -E -E is a mm -hmm. palindrome because it can be spelled one way the same as the other. Okay. You can assume that you, the, what you're, the value that you're getting passed in will always be a string. Okay. Uh, how to, whatever. Uh, now, can I check it in some online, uh, like JS Fiddle or some other environment? Sure, if you want to. Okay. No, I think this function works. Yep, exactly. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, all right. So, um, perfect. I just kind of wanted to start you off with that and we'll kind of go from there. Okay. Um, all right. So, let's do another string one here. Mm -hmm. um, so, I want you to write me a method to count the number of occurrences of a given character in a string. So, you're going to get um, two parameters. You're going to pass in a given character uh, and a string. And I want you to tell me uh, how many occurrences are in the given string C in the string string. Okay, for, uh, for example, if I gave you um, the, the function would call S as the character and mm -hmm. rings as the string. Um, and you would return back two to me because there are two S's in that string. Okay, got it. Um, and one piece of advice here for everyone listening uh, and you as well, um, as you're going through these methods and functions, um, it's always a good idea to kind of talk through what you're doing here. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so it's good to kind of talk through what you're doing and explain to the interviewer what you're working on and what you're doing. Um, they like to hear that, they like to get that feedback. Um, and it also helps to kind of just, uh, you know, spot check what you're actually working on. Okay, got it. Uh, so uh, what I'm thinking about this that, uh, is that uh, I want to uh, iterate th through the string, and so uh, every time I, I mean uh, I got a, a one uh, one letter in that string, I will check uh, if that is already stored in a in a in an object. Uh, no, uh, yeah. If you already have that, uh, if you already have that uh, letter in our uh, in, in the object. So let, let, me, let me just write some code to, to show that. 
Yeah, so uh, whenever, whenever we find the same string as the params, we will uh, add, add one to this count so that uh, it counts how many times th this params appears in that string. Okay, um, so kind of just, yep. all right, so kind of just walk me through uh, an example here. If you want to do it, like show your JS fiddle and walk through that, that's fine too. Um, just kind of walk me through this kind of code. Okay. Yeah, maybe it'll make it easier if you actually just kind of show your JS fiddle um, on your shared screen here and kind of show how it works and we can run through a couple test cases. Okay, so uh, let, let, me, let me share my uh, another screen here. And maybe just from now on, we can do the work in JS fiddle to make it easier. Okay. Yeah, I think it works. Cool. All right. Um, so let's move on here. Uh, a little bit more complicated question here. Mm -hmm. um, let's do with, um, so given um, an array of numbers from one to 100, um, we'll just start with a run to 100. We, for, for your test case or something, you just do like a 10 digit array or something like that. Um, exactly one number in that array is a duplicate. I want you to write a method um, to find that duplicate. Okay, so let me make sure. So uh, we have an array of, of a lot of numbers. And uh, so just one number in that array is duplicate. Yep. Yeah, uh, is that guaranteed to be duplicated more than once or? No, we're just gonna, for this particular question, uh, there only will be exactly one number duplicated. Okay, got it. So uh, I will uh, iterate through the array and uh, iterate through each numbers in this array and uh, to store each array in an in a object and store their, their times. Uh, so if, one, uh, if we, uh, when in the process of iterating through the array, if you find one element in that array that has, that has already been stored in the object, then that will be the one that is duplicate. So that is my general thinking of this. Ask. Uh, so if this uh, element hasn't been seen before, we will Give it a number. Uh, yeah, just some random number. And else, if it has been appeared before, just return this value. Mm. Uh, there may be something wrong with this. Uh, let me check it first. So, uh, 
yeah, it is working. Yeah, it is working. Okay. Um, so would this work with uh, multiple numbers being duplicated? So let's say that you added another a three and a three and a four. So add a four after that five. Uh, like this? Um, we'll do it. Do it so it's five four, um, just so they're not in order. Like uh, this. And then add a four before the five as well. Okay. Okay, so um, what, so it works, and that's exactly it worked uh, as I stated the first time. Mm -hmm. um, I said they would only be guaranteed. So now I want you to correct your method, mm -hmm. um, to return back multiple numbers that are duplicated. Okay, uh, so multiple numbers uh, that is duplicate, then uh, are they guaranteed to be duplicate? Uh, so uh, for example, are we, is the three allowed to appear more than twice in this array or is it just? Yes. Oh. Yes, you could have three multiple times. Okay, got it. So I uh, uh, have a array to store all the duplicate values. And uh, if it has appeared before, we will uh, push this value in this array. And return this array. Let me check it first. Yeah, I think it works. Cool. Yep, that looks good. Um, so kind of just uh, explain just real quickly again for everyone um, what you kind of did here and what was your approach. Why did you choose um, to put it in an object like this instead of maybe just like looping through it a couple of times and checking there the first time? So the first time you did it right when we were just checking for one, Mm -hmm. How did you make the decision to put it in an object like that um, instead of just like maybe doing like two for loops inside of each other, inside of each other? Mm, so firstly, uh, two for loops, that'll be two, uh, the time complexity will be, will be uh, a, lot, uh, a lot more larger than this one. And then, uh, so for, uh, for an object, I will like establish a, kind of like a dictionary in my function and in JavaScript that the uh, uh, searching uh, function of dictionary is uh, maybe quicker. Yeah, so I choose this one. Yeah, so um, just as a quick side note here, um, guys who are listening, ladies who are listening, um, the doing the, the two for loops um, is an absolutely fine solution to do the first time um, as you're, you're kind of doing this uh, or walking through it the first time. However, uh, most likely the interviewer will come back and say, how can you improve this time-wise? Um, so he kind of jumped here to the kind of the ideal solution from the very beginning. Um, but typically if you, um, are just kind of like working through it and, and you have the two for loops, um, first, if that was your solution, that is absolutely a good solution. Um, just be warned that they're going to come back to you and probably ask, how can you improve this time wise? Okay, great. Um, let's do one more real quick. Okay. Um, so this one's a quite a bit more complex, um, but let's see if we have time to do this. Um, you may not have the time to finish it before the end, but let's just see how you approach it. Okay. Um, so given uh, a number, for example, one, two, two, five, eight, for example, um, I want you to translate it to a string um, with these following rules. One is translated to A, two to B, 12 to I, 26 to Z, okay? For example, the number one, two, two, five, eight can be tra or translated to A, B, B, E, H, A, V, E, H, A, B, Y, H, L, E, Y, uh, L, E, Y, H. So there's five different translations of one, two, two, five, eight. So I want you to write uh, a function or method to count the different ways to translate that number and print out the different translations of that number. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, let, let me ask one thing about the question. Yeah. Uh, so is, is one number is one number mapped to one letter? Um, not necessarily, right? Because a so in for example uh, twelve right here, 
Mm -hmm. um, could be uh, A, B, or it could be L, right? Oh, oh, yeah. So we're trying to find all permutations that are possible from that. Oh, okay, I see. Mm. So for example, uh, this one, two, two, five, eight can be translated to uh, A, B, B, E something or? A, B, yeah, so some of the pos, I think there's five translations for that string and I'll, let me give them to you real quick if you want to type them down. Um, it will be um, A, B, B, E, H. A, V, E, H. A, V, E, H? Uh-huh. Okay. A, B, Y, H. L, B, E, H. L, B, E, H. And L, Y, H. L, Y, H. Okay, I see why we are doing this. Uh, A, B, C, S, F, G, F. Okay. Uh, let me think about it for for a moment. Mm. So first, we need to segment it, uh, segment all the uh, numbers. So and check if they are mm, single digit or double digit. If it's single digit, of course, we can translate that to a to a letter. And if uh, and if it's uh, Double digit, we will check if this number is under 26, so it can translate to another number. Yeah, and then we will uh, find the permutation of all the possible solutions, possible combinations. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, kind of just give me, because we've got about uh, seven minutes or so to like get through this. So, you don't have to necessarily write code, just kind of like talk to me through a little bit of the process of how you would do that. Just okay. kind of like approach, um, just verbally. Um, if you want to write some pseudocode to help explain it, that's great too. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to see your approach and still leave some time for questions. Okay, uh, let me uh, let me run through my mind for a second. Mm. So first, I, I think I, I will establish a, a dictionary to store all, all of the uh, numbers between uh, mapped with the letters. That's the first step. Okay. And then uh, I will um, second the uh, the numbers to see how many how many ways of segmentations are there for these numbers, and the uh, detailed process of segmenting is that uh, I will try one by one. For 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 example, I will try firstly to uh, segment. The numbers to all the, all uh, all of the numbers are segmented into single digit, and then uh, keep one single digit and uh, try others with the, with uh, double digit, and do that loop continuously to find all of the combinations, and then translate all of the uh, segmentations to number combinations. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so that leaves us with about, no, that's actually uh, a good way to approach it. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, cool. Um, so I'm going to leave about 15 minutes here. Um, so I'll start with you. If you have any particular questions about the interview process, um, any other questions or comments you'd like to make, and then I'll kind of open it up to everyone here. Okay. So, uh, I now uh, I aim to be a front end developer, and so I, I'm working on JavaScript and mostly and web development. So, uh, one thing I, um, that always confusing confusing me is that uh, what should I work on the most as a front end developer? Should I uh, work on more like data structures and algorithms, or should I focus more on the uh, features on JavaScript, or some uh, to have more developing experience on new frameworks or some new projects? Yeah. So, so my my recommendation for everyone on that question, um, you know, frameworks first of all they come and go. Um, mm -hmm. Frameworks also help. Um, you to like make better decisions or write better code. Mm -hmm. They are not a solution to a problem. Mm -hmm. You can't use a framework to solve um, your coding experience or to solve a problem or issue that you may have. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that I 
prefer to do personally and I recommend to anyone who I'm bringing on on my team or looking for and anyone who I'm bringing on my team is, is a core JavaScript knowledge um, mm -hmm. and that really strong, um, you, know, you know, CS background or data structures, uh, informations and how to apply that solution. Um, mm -hmm. Honestly, if, you, if we're working in React or working in Angular and you have never used a framework before, but you are a rock solid JavaScript developer and you know the basic like JavaScript, uh, like, you know, you know, like the hash tables or, you know, and you know, like a, a queue and a stack and a linked list and an array and the, I mean, you know, like doing like sortings, like a, a binary sort or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that is way, way, way more valuable than knowing a bunch of frameworks. Um, okay, the, frameworks the frameworks are super easy to pick up. I mean, to be honest, like, even when I'm learning new things, I focus on like the core of how things work, um, mm -hmm. the data structures and that kind of stuff. Because to be completely honest, when you get into a job, the frameworks kind of come and you can, it's just syntax. Like you can just kind of learn how to, they just make your life easier. But if you, if you learn a framework and you don't understand how it's working behind the scenes, you won't know how to apply it anyway. So being able to like know how like the, the data structures work and how to sort things and do that kind of stuff will make you a better framework developer because you'll understand how those frameworks work behind the scenes. Okay. I got it. Thanks. Yep. So to answer your question, yes, I would make sure that you focus more on um, algorithms, data structures, uh, core JavaScript or core programming languages, uh, mm -hmm. node or something like that. Uh, you know, like core uh, information instead of like a, a react or an angular or something like that. Sure. They're good to have. Um, but to be honest, I would focus on one. If you're going to focus on a framework, I would pick one and stick with it. Um, you can, if you can take a job, even if you only learned angular and the company that you want to go work for is using react, that's not going to stop you. Uh, unless they're like a team of react developers, like building core react, uh, modules, like in the actual React, uh, you know, framework, you're really, you're really okay. Okay. And uh, another question is that, uh, as as you just said, uh, we are uh, we should focus more on the core functionality of, of the language. So, uh, how deep should uh, some say a front end developer dive into the data structure and algorithm knowledge? Because I know some other. Uh, programmers, they dive very deep into the algorithms and uh, learn very, very compli complicated algorithms. But uh, as far as I can see, uh, for web development and front-end developers, we don't, do not need so complicated algorithm knowledge. So, no, um, as, a, as a sole front-end developer, um, I think the basic, you know, algorithms, um, so maybe some quick sorting algorithms. I mean, there's a lot of like, I think it's good, even though that JavaScript has built-in sort methods, mm -hmm. um, I think it's still a good idea to understand how those work. Um, so as far as like what you should learn from like a, a front-end developer, um, I think you should understand how the core JavaScript functions work. I don't think you need to have like really complex algorithms or data structures, but JavaScript has a sort method and they have a filter or a find method. Mm -hmm. I think it would be very good to understand how those, those methods work. Okay. Got it. Um, if you're going to be more of a full stack developer, I think there is some benefit in learning some of those more complex data structures. I don't think that, I don't think you need to, I think you need to get the very basic ones, like a, maybe like a quick sort, a binary sort, uh, mm -hmm. how arrays, queues and stacks work, link lists, like the very basic stuff is very good to know. Like mm -hmm. do you need to know like some very specific machine learning type of data structure algorithm? No, unless you're going strictly into that. In most of those cases, you're probably going to learn it when you get on there anyway. But I think the core, uh, the core data structures and stuff, you definitely need to know. Okay. Mm, so uh, do you think uh, data structures such as uh, like graphs or very complicated trees are usable in front end developing? Um, I think in some instances they could be. Um, for example, if you're building, it's, it's very specific to the job that you're working on in the position. So it's good to do like kind of the research uh, on the position that you're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, for example, like if you're going to do something like D3, um, oh. which is like a lot of graphic uh, displaying to the screen, um, mm -hmm. it is good to know that kind of stuff because D3 can get very complex and, uh, you know, very strong on the, like your data and that kind of stuff. So 
Um, I, I think it kind of depends on the position. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, I think that is all my questions at the moment. Awesome. Um, I will open it up to anyone else on the call. Um, if you have a, a question that you'd like to ask, um, we've got about nine minutes left, so kind of just unmute and uh, ask away. Hello? Yes. Hi. Um, I mean, my name is Jessica, so I am coming into the front-end developer world kind of self-taught and through a boot camp. Um, is there anything – we? I dabbled around with different languages, but – after this is all said and done, I'm kind of trying to real, trying to give a grasp of why I'm getting into this and how I can demonstrate my coding skills in a technical interview. Because I, I touch up on it, but I don't want to make it seem like I'm not, I don't have the knowledge, but I've kind of picked up. I want to show that I can learn kind of deal. So how would you, how would a self-taught developer approach it? How should a self-taught developer approach the interview? Well, I, and I think that you, you've got to pull to your strengths. Um, you know, definitely you want to um, go in and, uh, you know, first of all, kind of apply to positions, at least getting some experience on a position that, that your strength is in. Um, but build on your strengths that you have. Like, uh, you know, you're, you focus on this boot camp. Maybe you focus solely on JavaScript. Um, so start with JavaScript. You know, really dive in deep to how JavaScript works, how um, you know, the internal methods work, like, like I said, like learn how the sorting method, like maybe step through in the debugger, how the sort method works and actually look through and see what it's doing inside of that sort method to really understand what is going on. So when I think that if you really understand how the JavaScript sort works, you're really going to learn how other sorts work and you can apply them to other languages. So I think the big thing is really getting an understanding in the language that you're comfortable in. So for example, JavaScript and maybe just like learn like the sorts and that kind of stuff and um, really get a strong feel for how that works. Um, and once you get that strong uh, experience, then it's really, it, it's really just a matter of, uh, you know, branching out and like learning the syntax of another language. Once you have those core fundamentals um, and, and core strengths by focusing on like a JavaScript or something like that, you can easily pick up another language um, and it's just syntax at that point. The, the, the principles and, and stuff apply from there. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. And I think another big thing to be in the interview process, like if you don't know an answer to a question, say you don't know. There's nothing wrong with saying you don't know. Okay. Uh, everyone is learning. Um, everyone's there. But like, say like, I don't know, but show interest in, in asking the developer like, hey, I don't know, but let's talk through this and then maybe it'll jar something in my memory. So maybe you don't know right away, um, but then he starts to explain something and then all of a sudden it clicks and you're like, oh, okay. And then you can go down a path and that's way better than just say, like trying to like figure out a solution that's way down the wrong path. Okay. Uh, I have another question. I just came up with it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, <laughs> what, is the, uh, what is the most important quality that an that, uh, uh, interviewer uh, focus on? Is that the person's knowledge or is the person's learning ability or how the person fits into their company's atmosphere, something like that? I think that's a little hard to say. Um, I think it's a, it's a combination of everything. Um, obviously, I think one of the more important things is fitting into the culture at the, at the company. Um, you know, I think showing the ability to learn is also a strong thing as well. Like, not everyone knows the answer to everything. Um, I sure don't. So by taking an interest in the company and showing that you're really excited about the company and then showing that you have the ability to like learn um, and walking through the questions, um, I, I think is a really good thing. Like you, you don't always have to like, don't always think that you have to jump to the most complex solution in your answers. Um, if it's, you know, if you can think of something that's really, really simple, but still solves it, it may not be the most algorithm, like, you know, it may, may, maybe the, not the best time complexity, like for example, in this last example, like do, creating two for loops instead of putting it in a hash map, uh, it's way better to, to go with a simple solution than to try and figure out the complex solution. Okay. So yeah, I think, I think the culture uh, and how you fit with the company is a very big thing. Usually on a phone screen or an interview like this, 
Um, they are looking more for how you're learning. Um, and then the culture kind of thing more comes when you're on site, um, when you're face to face, uh, they'll usually ask a little bit more like cultural questions. Okay. Thank you for a particular answer. Well, I have a question. Um, you know, when you said that, um, you didn't mind what language the person was, did he like cat has been, um, are you just being polite or is that legitimately, legitimately, um, okay to do? For example, for a lot of these, I prefer to use like Ruby, for example. Is that okay, even if you're applying to like a JavaScript role? Uh, can you say that one more time? You're a little hard to hear. Sorry, sorry. I was just wondering, um, would it actually be okay to do it in a different language? These classes? Yeah, I think, I think it's you should do it. And so sometimes some companies will be very, very specific and say you have to do it in a language. Um, so you do need to be prepared. Um, that's a very good question to ask um, the, the recruiter who you talk to. Um, hey, th this interview that I'm going to do, do I have to do this in a specific language or can I do it in the most comfortable language that I, you know, the language I'm comfortable with? A lot of times they'll say, do it in the language that you're most comfortable with. Um, so I think that's perfectly okay to do it in a language that you're comfortable with, but be warned that there are some companies out there that will be very specific and say, no, you have to do this in JavaScript or you have to do this in Ruby or you have to do this in C sharp. Um, if you get in one of those scenarios where you're doing that and you're already through the interviewing process, try your best. Um, you know, maybe write it in JavaScript and just say to the developer, Hey, here's how I would approach it. Uh, in JavaScript, I'm not very familiar with Ruby, uh, the Ruby syntax, but I would approach it by doing it this way and kind of go on to show it in your the language that you understand um, best. So I think it's a very good question to ask the recruiter uh, at the very beginning um, before you get on the technical interview. Um, to, to get comfortable. And if they say, oh, you have to do this in Ruby, um, then look up Ruby real quick before your interview and say like, how do I print something? How do I do a for loop? How do I do an if statement? You know, the very, very generic stuff that you need to like build, find out how to do that in that language just really quick. Maybe write it down on a piece of paper next to you um, just as a reference and say like, okay, I'm going to create a loop here. Okay. I just need to create a for loop. Okay. Um, so you kind of learn the syntax from there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. You're really okay. helpful. Thank you. Oh, I have another question. Sure. Uh, uh, will the, um, how complicated will, will, be, will, the inter, uh, will the coding challenge be in a front-end uh, interview? So for, for example, uh, actually, I think today's uh, coding, coding challenges are a little bit uh, easier than I imagined. So is, it, is there a possibility that uh, a company will give the interviewee some more complicated and very the time costing problems to solve? I think there's, there's some yes and no. Um, some companies, like at a first interview, um, they may kind of, I know a lot of companies like to start out um, asking the simple questions first, um, just to make sure that like you have the generic understanding and they know where to go with you, where you fit in with inside the company and they kind of grow from there. Um, mm -hmm. Typically, I like to, to kind of get a general idea of how the developer works, how they, uh, you know, their basic understanding of data structures and, uh, you know, questions and CS questions and that kind of stuff. And then I get a little bit more complex um, when I bring them on site. For example, um, definitely gets a little bit more complex when they get on site. I'll actually have some uh, debugging questions that may come up um, or even some side-by-side -side pair programming where you actually are building a feature in our app itself um, with the developer, uh, you know, hand in hand. So I think it kind of ranges from there. I think, um, I think it's always very good to keep practicing and keep challenging yourself. So there's a lot of questions online. So really just, it, it's about how you learn and how you approach a question, uh, more so than like how long it takes you or anything like that. So I think always learning and always finding these questions and challenging yourself to answer these questions without looking at the answer, um, will keep you moving forward and keep you improving. Okay. Thank you. Um, any last questions? We're about six o'clock, but, um, I'll take one more question if anyone's got one. Uh, would you have any idea, any differences between, uh, interviewing for a startup versus interviewing for a corporation and how prepared we should be for either one like the differences? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think it really varies from startup to startup and from company to companies. Um, a lot of the big companies uh, and corporate companies, you'll find that their structure is very, very similar. Um, 
Whereas a startup, especially a not as established startup, um, those ones are, are typically more on the end of how well you fit with the team. Um, because when you have two developers, uh, like a startup or something like that, it really, really is more like how you fit in with the other developers and the other teammates more so than your, uh, the ability. I think that for like a startup, um, it's way, way more important to understand how you learn, um, and how well you fit in. Um, whereas like a corporate will be kind of more of like a balanced interview where it's a little bit more like how you fit in the team, how well you understand the basics and, uh, like the interview questions, uh, and that. So how to structure them. That's kind of hard to say, but usually startups are a little bit more like how you fit in with the team. Um, sometimes they'll ask more specific questions about their particular things, or they're usually the ones who are a little bit more picky on what languages, uh, you fit in. So they're the, usually the ones that'll say like, Oh, we only want you to do it in Ruby or only want you to do it in JavaScript because they don't really have room or the bandwidth to kind of, teach you um, while you come on. Uh, they really want you to come on and focus and, and hit it hard. Um, so those are usually a little bit more like focused interview points at a startup. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right, guys. Well, it was awesome. Um, I'm going to hopefully this interview will be uh, recorded somewhere um, and she'll, she should send out an email where it's going to be posted. I'll also get with her um, and post all of the questions I answered in here as well and a link to where you can find the solution. Um, so that way you guys can kind of practice these, look at these, review these uh, um, from time and time uh, as you go through it. Um, also, uh, I'm on Code Mentor. Um, my name on there. Feel free to shoot me with a question. If you have any questions after that, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, we can do a free 15-minute uh, session. Uh, if you want as well, if you have any quick questions that you want to ask, uh, or we can uh, go through any problems or issues you have from there. Okay. All right, guys, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, one last question, sir. Uh, can, I get, uh, can I get kind of like a feedback or uh, something similar to that on how did I do or how, uh, what kind of uh, things should I improve on the interview? Yeah, I think... Um, you know, your, your programming sense is very strong. Uh, you went through, uh, the, uh, the questions correctly, um, and you approached them with the right answers. I think some of the feedback I would say on that is a little bit more talking as you're going through the, the coding perspectives, um, mm -hmm. and explaining exactly what you're doing and saying like, okay, I'm going to create an object here to create a hash map. Uh, you can't create a real hash map in JavaScript. So I'm going to use an object to do that. Um, and, and go from there. Um, so giving a little bit more information on how that works and how you're working uh, and doing that is, is kind of giving that feedback would be good. Um, other than that, I think it would be good. Uh, to be honest, I'd bring you on uh, for, for either a second round of interviewing um, or an on-site interview. Um, mm -hmm. So it would, that, that's, that would be my feedback. Um, and it would kind of just depend on the position. But uh, I definitely would be uh, definitely next steps from here. Okay. Got it. Thank you, sir. Great. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much and, uh, have a good night.